Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are Pull on the Call podcast. My name is Mandy Mack. And I am Chris Rivers. And today we are together with episode number 29, which is how you and your studio can train for a poll competition and form a competition team. Yes, so exciting. This will go hand in hand with an episode we already had of how you could train for a competition. Um, this is more advanced, I guess. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, right. If let's say you like were a lone person just um, doing a competition by yourself, and then you thought maybe like there would be more fun having a little bit more togetherness and inviting your poll friends to compete with you. And then if there's enough of you, um, maybe your studio can get involved if they're not already. Yes, love it. Awesome. Um, so do you want to go into our first way of how we could start training for competitions in the studio? Because you definitely have experience with this. Um, yeah, sure. We, um, first, like, you have to decide which competitions are best for your students. And um, I re we really like full sport organization because it's an amateur competition. And it's open to everyone. And I really feel like you should offer the, the opportunities to all of your pole dancers and not just like your best polers and your, you know, like most creative dancers. Um, everyone should be able to have an opportunity to get on the stage. So that's why it's kind of a cool thing to have a team together and it will show, um, it brings all of your students together too um, with togetherness. And we'll talk a little bit about the competition that might appear amongst your students too. But um, other than that, it really like, it boosts your, your students' morale. It makes them better pole dancers and helps them work together too and um, perform, which is maybe something that a lot of us have not been able to do before. We became pole dancers. <laughs> Yes. Um, another amateur friendly one, I think, um, is pole circus. It's only virtual, but um, I thought I do. I did enjoy that one. That one was pretty fun, I must say. PSO is both virtual and in person. Um, they're still doing virtual, right? Yeah, I think they're seasonal now instead of every month. Okay, so still doing virtual, but not as much. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, but yeah, Pole Circus is definitely another amateur friendly one you should definitely check out too. Besides PSO, <laughs> yes. And then beyond that, there is other there's professional competitions or um, competitions that are more geared toward like you know perfection of tricks and technique and stuff like that. Um, and that would be up to your students to decide, or or you know, in your classes to decide what kind of. Uh, competitions that you should all participate in yeah. it depends on your goals <laughs> um, with I guess with that being said how do you start training for a competition how do you get it involved in your studio well I guess first find students that want to be in a competition <laughs> for kids <laughs> um you can maybe try to explain to them how motivating it could be to, and how much it can help them in their pole progress and just what a beautiful and um, interesting experience it can be. But you have to first get the students that wanna compete um, and then get, this, um, then you go from there, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> right, like maybe you all attend a competition first just to see what it's like. Are you all um, volunteer behind the scenes? Because there's always volunteer opportunities for pole dancers to volunteer for pole competitions and see what it's like before you get on the stage. Or, you know, maybe one of you set out and did it last year and then they can come back and tell the rest of your pole friends how to like prepare. Yeah. But yeah, but this will be a little guide in case you don't have a pole friend who has done it before. <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> we are your pole friend. <laughs> um, I will say, after you find your students who want to compete, um, make sure you know the competition, the rules, the deadlines, um, what's not allowed, 
when you had to pay the fee, when you had to send your information, make sure you know all of that so you can give your students the correct information and ensure that they don't miss out. I have missed deadlines before and it um, sucks. Um, so you wanna definitely make sure you know all that information. And I don't wanna say give them reminders because I mean, we're all adults, but give them reminders because we all have lives. And I mean, these are your students and stuff. So if that's like, um, what you do with pulling the wall, creating a competition WhatsApp chat. Um, definitely know those deadlines. It would really suck if you get excited and then you miss everything. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of the reason why um, our studio has the WhatsApp chat and we put all of our competitors into one place. And I write updates to everyone every Monday, just kind of giving everyone the deadlines that are looming. So you you're aware of them every single week. And then um, it's a good way for all of the your teammates to like chat with each other and share like costume ideas, prop ideas, you know, piece ideas, share, um, hey, I got my combo, like I didn't die at the end of my routine videos <laughs> and stuff like that. And it really brings everyone together and it's, it's fun. I like it a lot. <laughs> Alrighty, so after you found your students, after you remembered all the dates and you make sure your students know them to get them all registered, what do you do next? <laughs> you have to coach your students. So yeah. offer some sort of coaching for your students. Depending on um, what we did this year, um, which I'm hoping will fare us better with the judges' scores, but we really delved into, um, we're, we're all going to PSO Northeast in in the fall or i guess it's the fall winter in the winter um but last year we we all were in the artistic category and we were very artistic but not storytelling so we really delved into the judges criteria and we we developed these um coaching classes coaching workshops for our students so um you know we've got one in create a choreo so if you want to like learn how to make your storyboard for your dance um, you come to that one. And then we have one on spin flow and musicality. We have one for dancing with props. So all of the things that you would be judged upon um, in your routine, we've got workshops for those. And that's just something that we were starting this year. Last year, we had a different sort of approach. We had um, students sign up for a competition team class. So they were all um, the students who wanted to participate in this were all together for a certain amount of weeks and they trained with the same coach the entire time um, for their pieces to prepare them like that. So this year we have all different coaches coaching all of the team um, at the same time. So we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm feeling really positive about it because you gotta look at the judging criteria. You can't just go on that stage all willy nilly. <laughs> <laughs> now that we did that last year, but um, we were very expressive in a, in a way that was not um, easier to, to be comprehended in the judging criteria. So now we're going to be better this year. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, you know, we offer our students private coaching one on one for any um, tricks that they want to get for their routines, stuff like that. But I would really recommend having some sort of like cohesive team, like like WhatsApp group or a Facebook group or whatever you guys all agree on to just stay in touch and feel togetherness. <laughs> so after you set up some workshops and plan some good content for those students competing, what do you want to do? I would say probably definitely communicate with those students a little more in depth to find out what their poll goals are. Um, if it's a level or a level or like, how do you say a category competition, definitely find out what their goals are for there. Um, some competitions aren't as like category based as that. So definitely talk with them, find out what they want to do, what their goals are, what they can do. I recommend making a, I mean, you go over this in your workshops, but make a list of everything they know they can do and everything they might want to do and everything that they want to do it, but it probably won't happen. 
Yes. From there, um, and like Mandy said, really read the judge criteria because depending on the competition, you might miss the mark unintentionally. Um, it just happens. And sometimes they even tell you like moves you shouldn't perform based on your level or like different songs you might not want because of words used. Um, so definitely read those regulations and definitely have that conversation with your student, find out what their goal is, find out what they wanna do, how they can train, what their schedule is. Cause some people go into a competition and like, I'm like, how do you do it? Like you need to wake up early and go to bed late with your schedule. But I mean, they manage. Um, and that's part of the coaching process, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to mention too, like everyone's got their own training style, but there's um, like the students that want to train completely by themselves for the competition, um, you need to find a creative solution for them because everyone will need to like present in front of other people at, at some point like more than once before you get on that stage and um I know because I'm a private person I like to practice on my own too and you know I find over and over again that's to my detriment because I haven't you know properly prepared myself for now being face to face with another human being looking at me while I'm doing all my tricks <laughs> I was doing them so beautifully by myself in the studio alone you know my little baby blanket but the reason why we're performing on the stage in a competition is to show who we are and um you know there there could be some private students that want to just practice everything on their own but please still check in with these students um especially for like safety and you know the judging criteria and you know they're representing your studio too so you want to show that you have at least some communication with those students in case they like do a trick that wasn't for that level and, and they're like ah i wish i had known that <laughs> like you could have told them that if you had peeked in a little bit but yeah, everyone's got a different learning style, training style, um, and encourage your students to explore different training styles. We have a lot of different interviews with different pole competitors um, that have come through on our podcast too. So check those out. Um, I know I've learned a lot about different training styles just from listening to everyone speak about it. But yeah, there, I don't think there's any wrong training style as long as you're safe and you get it done on time, I guess. <laughs> um yes so true i love that you brought up different training styles because it is very important and there are people who like to do it alone <laughs> um it's interesting because i'm more like yeah if you want to see okay <laughs> like i won't post on the gram because i don't want people to see it yet but at the studio i'll be like okay <laughs> yeah yeah right like that's where the the whatsapp group is private and you can share like whatever you know in there Unless, let's talk about the times when your students, or even you, might be competing against your students, or competing against, you know, your peers, or students might be competing against each other. So this is something that happened to, to me a few times, and, you know, I've gotten better at it. Um, <laughs> the best thing is to do is to, as a a teacher, you know, as a coach of your students who are in this competition, please don't pin them against each other. Please don't do that. Please don't take them aside and be like, oh, you know, this person has the this move in their, their um, routine and you're in the same category as them. Maybe you should consider not doing that same move. Don't do any of that because they could be doing the same move, but the way they're doing it is so different. And like, that could be their favorite move. And now you're taking that away from them and you're ruining their confidence. Not that this has happened to me, you guys. <laughs> but anyway, it's not good to, to, to encourage unhealthy competition amongst your students or your peers. Um, there is healthy competition and it is a little bit harder to find, but <laughs> reminding your students that they're always competing against who they were yesterday, you know, who they were at the last competition because you're always going to show who you are authentically on stage. And it doesn't matter, um, you know, if you're competing against your, your pole bestie, <laughs> hopefully you'll be able to, to find a way to like keep rooting for each other and, and like, you know, keep supporting each other. And so you, you don't ruin friendships at competitions. Yes. 
I mean, that's so hard. We are definitely, there's always a little piece of us, even if you say no, that wants to win. <laughs> um, but we are in this together. So whether you win or your friend wins, your studio's taking home the medal, which is awesome. And I mean, friendly competition is okay, but you're right, don't ruin it and don't instigate it, um, especially if you're a studio owner. Um, you, yeah, I agree with how important it is to kind of just, because you can get in someone's head. It is sad, but it is true. Um, Right, it's stressful to compete as it is, and now you got to figure out being completely, you know, different from this person who maybe like has intimidated you. Yes. You know, God, I'm like, oh, I hope, I hope that doesn't happen. I don't know if anybody's going to be in my level or my category from our studio, but I'm just like, let's all have fun. I would love to win, but I just want to perform. <laughs> That's it. I feel like as long as we and um. Dallas Charming, when she said, remember the F word, remember to have fun. <laughs> we always have to remember to have fun because, because like, like you said too, it, um, we might be in it for the metal, but in the end, like this, the metal represents the studio and, and, you know, all the hard work that everyone put together to make you shine on the stage. So <laughs> yeah, unhealthy competition. It's so easy to like, even like, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be competing against some of my friends <laughs> in, in November, but I'm, I'm actually really just excited to come back to compete in. Um, it's been a little while for me and um, just to enjoy how my body can move <laughs> for another year, you know, not too worried about winning any medals or anything. Um, yeah. It's just like you said more excited about the performing than the medal i mean a medal would be awesome god it would be fucking awesome but i am definitely more excited to just perform in front of people especially with what i have planned i am like super stoked even if i don't win i'm like i'm gonna have fun <laughs> right yes yeah and like it's such an opportunity for for everyone to just um be on stage uh, especially like that's why I say you should always bring the idea up to every single one of your students like not just the ones who seem to be dancers or seem to be you know like strong or whatever you want to showcase your best students whatever you can do that but you should always ask all of your students because uh, there a lot of times when we come to poll deep down we've always wanted to be called a dancer and then like when we come to pole class, we're like, okay, it's happening for me. And then there's a stage opportunity to perform. And then like, that's when a lot of pole dancers really like embody the, the term that I like, I am a dancer and they start to like feel that. And also like embodying the term that I'm an athlete. That's another one. Um, I think that one came for me. Cause I was always like, I'm a dancer, like, duh. Um, but the athlete part, when that part sunk in, I was like, wow, you know, like, I'm training like an athlete. I'm, you know, doing all these things that an athlete does. So like, let's call ourselves an athlete. And you can really empower your students by, you know, reminding them of all their hard work and what it means. <laughs> so what are some other ways to get your studio ready for a competition? Uh, <laughs> I would say motivate them in a fun way. And that could be anywhere from getting them team apparel or maybe even having a team brunch or lunch or get together or something get them unified um joined as a community um because we're all different we all have different stories we all have something to learn from each other i think um but apparel is definitely motivated uh, and then i mean a nice little get together it doesn't have to be necessarily dinner but even if you're just dancing and showing parts of your routine is always fun as well yes yeah i definitely that's what in our this year's schedule for our, our workshops i tried to include more togetherness times where like after our workshops um, they last an hour and then students are welcome to stay for the next hour and a half and just like practice with each other you know workshop with each other and and have more communication rather than, you know, just leaving it as private coaching. Uh, I think the, you know, the more eyes you have on your routine too, it's really hard to, when you're making your routine, 
to you have your concept and like you go through and like maybe you choreographed it and then you and then you show it and then the first person you show it is like wow I don't know what that story was and then you show it to another person and they also can't find your story so then there's a problem then you, like it might be too late for you if you didn't incorporate that communication throughout your process you know what I mean so yeah <laughs> having eyes and communication as you devise your routine yeah coaching togetherness oh my gosh the team jackets though <laughs> <laughs> they're so much fun and now we have to get them every year though <laughs> It's really, it's actually like, it's really cool though, because not everyone wins a medal, but everyone, you know, has the jacket and you still feel really cool. <laughs> like, yes, I was here. I did this. I, what's it called? Nailed it, as they say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, there were a few of us last year too, like also with the togetherness thing, a few of us like placed last. And we were like, you know what? <laughs> we still got on that stage. Like, you still kicked ass. We still did our best. Like, we are last place winners. There's no such place uh, or no such thing as, you know, last place losers. Everyone who gets on the stage is a winner. Just keep reminding your students that along the way, like, some people don't even make it to the stage. Like, they'll sign up. They'll do a little bit of practicing. You know, something will come up. And then they don't make it on stage. But you did. <laughs> oh, good times. Good times. I didn't get last place, but I didn't win. And it was a, definitely a learning and humbling experience for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? I've been the winner and the loser and everywhere in between. <laughs> I didn't do bad at this year. I'm just going to have fun. I'm excited. <laughs> yes. Me too. Uh, I, I want to remember to have fun too. Yeah. As we get into old now too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like I was like, I want to just get on the stage. Where I'm, you know, 41 now. Like <laughs> I know for some, some pollers, like they're probably like going to be like, you are only 41. <laughs> but you know, as we get older, our bodies start to do things. And I'm just so happy that I'm able to train and like get tricks and, and really like encourage the students to do it if they want to see themselves grow as a pole dancer like really quickly <laughs> that's what you'll notice um if anybody trains for a competition you're gonna get really good really fast um in a very different way too yeah so true um what else can you do start preparing in advance like at least two yeah. um Two months is a good rule of thumb, if um, not longer. But there's nothing like, yeah, who wants to join this competition? It's in a month, month and a half. Oh, well, that really puts the pressure on. And that really kind of sets people up for a bit of failure. Um, so plan in advance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was thinking about that, too. Like, what is the proper timeline? Like you said, I think two months is probably like the last resort. And the I'm PS making that decision. Competition manual I bought from PSO. I actually just got an email for an updated version today. Um, what was I going to say? Yes, it says if you can start it off before the two month mark because then you have leeway and stuff. But definitely at least two months. That's yeah. Because I mean, we're we're four months away now, and I, you know my combos that I'm trying, I just want to get them solid. Maybe it depends on, on your level too. And you know, your expectations for yourself, if you like wanted to get that really big trick and you started working on it, you know, four months before the competition, and then you got it like within three months of the competition, then you should be okay. Yeah. But if you did not get the trick and it is two months, Please take the trick out of your routine. <laughs> There's no point in trying to be a hero in the last two months and just trying to like make that one trick work. Um, you know, especially if you've been trying to make it work for a while. We don't need any heroes. 
on the stage. <laughs> I'm really excited. This year, last year, I tried to focus a lot on tricks and I didn't have as much fun. I really wanted to win. This year, I'm trying to focus more on the performance and getting people to smile and laugh. And yeah, a cool trick here and there, but it's really been interesting focusing on something else. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, same thing for me. I really want to, um, I am one of the artistic performers that doesn't really understand how to tell a story, but I am confident that my story will come through to everyone this year. Um, I have a really solid idea that I'm really excited about, but I'm not going to say anything about in case it doesn't work. <laughs> but yeah. Year. so you're brave for doing it this year I'll do it again next year <laughs> right? it was mostly because like I wanted to do I was like I'm never doing artistic again so I signed up for low flow floor work and then I got sad that I couldn't climb the pole <laughs> so I was like fuck it I'll just do rx it's fine it's I'll be okay I'll figure it out but yeah maybe we should talk about you know like coaching being a coach for the um, your students and at the same time developing your own routine for the competition because that's a lot it's a lot yeah <laughs> so if you are an instructor who's taking on this incredible feat <laughs> please make sure that you you know plan ahead like there's um there's a time when you know like for my choreo classes where I'll stop being able to like make any more choreo or like receive any more choreo or do fit any more choreo in my head. So for my students, I'll repeat a lot of stuff um, toward the, the end of when the competition is supposed to happen. And also students um, who are competing, they don't really wanna learn any new tricks toward the end either. They're kind of like scared <laughs> to like do anything new. They just wanna like, you know, be calm and practice. So that's just something to think about as you get closer to the competition. Um, I also like to, I always tell you this too, um, cheat in a way if you're an instructor, like if you know you have a trick or a combo that you have in your routine, like there's no doubt about it, find a way to kind of work a conditioning exercise or that trick into your class. So it gives you extra practice um, with it on both sides and in a teaching environment. Um, I found that has really helped work for me, especially with time management. I'll be like, oh, I didn't get to condition my shoulder mounds, but we're going to do it in my high level class. <laughs> so, um, things like that. It really does help. Um, it is a nice cheat. Of course, listen to your body, but it does really help if you just kind of consciously plan your lesson and be like, hey, I need to condition this. I wasn't able to. Let me see if I can slide this in my lesson plan yeah yeah I love that too I also do that like <laughs> it's like ah my shoulder mounts are really weak in my routine guess what we're doing today everyone <laughs> but also too like we you also um as you monitor your team you have to monitor them for um you know if they're if they're stressing themselves out how does your team feel and and there comes a time where I think it's like maybe like three weeks before the competition where you can definitely feel the, the change in the air where everyone was like having a good time. And now they're all like, I must get everything right now. <laughs> and then that's the time when you have to like swoop in, you know, remind everyone that it still should be fun. Maybe you have some like silly games that you play with your team. Um, maybe that's the time that you have your, you know, ice cream pizza party. <laughs> something like that um, maybe you have a massage party that's something that I always thought about like wouldn't that be amazing you could also have like a massage circle we need to bring massage circles back <laughs> where everyone sits in a circle and everyone gets their back massage like <laughs> like we need those <laughs> no one does them anymore <laughs> or we can do like those the hand ones with the little balls yeah I got my distance in between. That's true. Yeah, we'll we'll make it for COVID. <laughs> but yeah, just something. Just monitor your students because sometimes people react to stress in different ways, and you just have to be on the alert to to notice that if if people are like, you know, if they were having a good time, now they're like really reserved. 
maybe talk to them, find out what their, um, their issues are and see if you can offer them some support. And that's like the, the top thing, um, you know, with your team, you need to offer them support. And sometimes it's like saying, giving your own routine, like a little back burner for a little bit, just so you can, you know, sometimes it's their first time on stage. You got to like, <laughs> you got to do a lot. Um, yeah. The offering advice for stage etiquette. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Some people have never been on the stage before. Yes. You mentioned monitoring them to their mental health and making sure they're okay. Also monitor over training to that's yeah. Definitely. Like Mandy said, monitor them. If like their kind of emotions change and they're kind of, different than they were before but overtraining too you might not even realize it but those students they are like I gotta get this I gotta get this and they're training not only in that class but they are training at home and they're like yeah it's a little a little but they're really doing like more than a little a little um so definitely monitor them that way um which I guess also if they are getting overtrained lead into like the kind of like tiredness and mental instability mm. um which just goes to show push that rest like right like, yeah resting. yeah and it's just like like before reminding your students that they're training like an athlete because they are an athlete they're you have to pay attention to um one thing you know i'm i'm vegan and i um was vegan when i was training uh for nationals and i found that i was getting really really tired um and so I increased my protein intake, but then that wasn't even enough. My body wanted cheese. So then I started, you know, I ended up being vegetarian. It's just like listening to your body. I'm back to vegan. My body is telling me all sorts of things, but, um, but yeah, like it's, it's um, really important. Everyone increases their water intake, like a lot, like way more than you would think. Um, just so, and um, you're not tired all the time protein. <laughs> it's something that I didn't really think about. I thought I was, you know, getting enough protein with my regular diet, but as you build muscles and, you know, the endurance to get through up to a four minute routine, like that takes a lot of strength and power. So you need to like fuel your body like an athlete. So just reminding your students and your team that and setting a good example yourself. Yeah. And not overtraining rest is practice <laughs> competitors um will even i've read a lot like the world pole competitors they'll even take a nice three day to a week break like a couple weeks before the competition just to fully like recharge their body and then like train hard because by that time two three weeks you should already have everything trained you're just kind of you should be already be repeating the routine to get in your body so yeah. Right, like it's a possibility that you could be overtraining and then ruining, like sabotaging what you've already done. Because, you know, if you push your body too much or you're doing the routine and it's only on one side forever mm -hmm. and ever, like you're gonna get really imbalanced. And then if you continue in that, um, who knows what will happen? <laughs> you mentioned that because that brings us another way of how you can help your students have them practice the other side. It will completely change. Um, it will completely change the ball game, like um, getting them to think about their dance routine on the other side. And it, like you said, helps you stay balanced. Um, I think that was one of my biggest things with PS. So I did not practice the other side. Um, but when I did other competitions, I started a little bit and you do see a difference. It's really weird. It does help you kind of connect pieces better. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to do like the full out on the other side. Um, what I, my personal training schedule right now is, um, I have two, two days per week where I'll do competition stuff. The first day is conditioning. I'll do my handstands, shoulder mounds, you know, and then I will do all of the tricks on the silly side. But I'm doing like Bird of Paradise now on the right side. And I don't want to do Bird of Paradise on the left side. But something that's very similar is the Jade Split. So I'm doing the Jade Split. I'm turning into No Hands Jade. Um, it's excruciating and it sucks. <laughs> but I leave my practice feeling so much more balanced so that when I come in the next time and I do 
the bird of paradise in my routine on the other side, I don't feel like like this walking around forever because I got Mm -hmm. my bird of paradise on the one side. (laughs) But yeah, just looking at your routine and finding like, like, let's say you're doing a lot of like pulling like this. Maybe you should just like hang out in a handstand um, for like, you know, a minute or so after your practice, just to balance things out. Spin or something. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) yeah spending time of doing the opposite of what you are doing is always going to be beneficial yeah and it'll take your mind off of it too you'd be like oh today i'm doing alternate practice day (laughs) and you might actually like that side better and it does help because um sometimes when we're on stage we get disheveled and we go to the wrong side so if you practice that wrong side well fuck it i'm on the wrong side but i already know what i'm doing <laughs> but i'll be fine right <laughs> it's, oh my god i've seen a lot of performers just get disheveled and like go on the wrong side and because they didn't train the other side it kind yes. of up a little bit it happened to me in class last night <laughs> and I was so glad that I had done, you know, the thing on both sides because I was like, wow, right now I'm on my silly side for everyone. <laughs> I recently made it a rule to like start demonstrating on my silly side. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what really changed my view about it is Donna Carnell, because yes. as we all know, like her, her combos are like ridiculous. But to hear her say that she always practices them on both sides is like. If she can do that, <laughs> I can do my lame little combo on both sides. <laughs> but yeah, like just say, um, having a team for your students is probably the best thing if you're going to go to a competition. Um, or if you don't feel like having a team, just, you know, encourage the students that are doing the competition to stay together and check up, check up on them. Um, even if you don't want to do like a full blown team, because it is a little time consuming. But if it's something that you love, which is, it's turned into something that I love. (laughs) I always feel like a pusher for competitions, but I, I always see like, you know, the burning desire in our students to like perform and it's, it's a wonderful opportunity and you can win a medal. Like who wouldn't want that? It definitely helps you. I feel like it helps you grow as a pole instructor. And I'd imagine as a studio owner as well, I feel like teaching and coaching are similar but two different things and I feel like it's a great way for you to grow help other students and the students would most of them definitely appreciate any help they can get if they come to you Um, yeah but if you don't create it (laughs) (laughs) right like yeah and I guess that another thing we should address is like um you know, you're going to set the tone for your competition team and how you um, communicate to your students and and how they will be, you know, toward the competition and, and toward others they might encounter at the competition. So it's up to you to, to transform your team into whatever type of vibe that you want to present and represent your studio. Um, it's not a good idea to go to the competition with your team and and promote the idea that you're all going to beat each other. Like that's, I feel like that's not the way to go um, ever. But that's maybe a vibe that I don't understand. And maybe that's your vibe and that's cool. But to me, I feel like that's toxic and uh, it's not really... Um, making the competition fun when it should be fun. I'm like, how do you feel about that, Chris? <laughs> I feel, how do I feel about that? Let me see. When I was at PSO last year, there were, I was in line and there were a couple of like mean girls behind me talking so much crap about other people. So I can definitely understand what you're talking about. Um, 
I don't know wh who these girls were, what studio they were from, but they were really like, really just like, oh my God, that person should be on the stage. Oh my God, that invert sucked. That jazz. And it really like pissed me off. I was like, I'm about to be on this stage and these women are talking massive shit. So I definitely understand what you mean by that. Definitely, um, it's okay to be competitive, but you want your team also to be open and accepting and welcoming of everyone because when you get on that, in that audience or on that stage, there's going to be a lot of different people of all different levels. And you don't want to ruin someone else's experience. Um, you never know who's listening, who's overhearing. Um, you never know who's an earshot. Um, and that could really, that really, A, makes you look awful and B, kind of fuck someone else's day up. Um, we're all pole dancers, we're all different, we all look different, we're all different sizes and ages and stuff. And when you're in a competition, you shouldn't be talking shit about other people. Save it for the hotel room. Um, be supportive, even if it's not your cup of tea, give a little golf clap. There's no reason to be talking shit, saying that Jasmine sucks, that person can't invert, that is not your place. <laughs> that right? is, um, it's supposed to be encouraging and motivating and let your students know that, yeah, it's okay to be competitive, but don't be disrespectful. Right, like it, it all comes down to like, do you want people to remember your team as the team that like rooted for everyone and was supportive to everyone? Or do you want people to remember your team that, um, you know, like they were in the bathroom talking shit about everyone and, and people overheard and they always remember you for that. Like, I wouldn't want to be remembered for that. <laughs> but you're right that it exists in the in competitions unfortunately and it's not like a lot um it's not like it's rampant but every so often you'll find someone who um who takes it in a different way <laughs> and maybe that's what they need to you know feel good about themselves or to push themselves and everyone's different but it's all up to how you want your team to um to be Yeah, so true. I don't even know what to say to that. It's so sad that uh, no matter like if the gay community, the HIV community, the pole dance community, there's still like, how do you say a civil war? Like you're the same stigmatized group, but you're still fighting amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess it just like, um, you know, maybe... I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to try to understand people. <laughs> oh, um, it, it sucks because competition really gets people competitive. It can really bring out the ugly in people. Um, yeah. I know that was my first PSO. And I, it, um, if it wasn't for all the other good stuff, I would have really been like, that just kind of deters me. Like, I thought this was an open and welcoming place. Um but it was open and welcoming. It was just that little, those little, whoever the fuck they were. Um, and hopefully that will stop and people will stop doing that in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I personally have never encountered anyone um, saying or being negative in front of me, but I have definitely heard stories from, from you and other students that overheard um, someone else being dumb and... So just, you know, I think that's a good thing to, to remind your team to like, as you get closer to the competition, just remember that it should be fun. Um, if it's fun in your heart and you're there for, you know, just to be yourself and be a wonderful dancer and a performer, then it doesn't matter what anyone else um, says around you, um, especially if they're being rude personally to you, like they can go suck it. <laughs> <laughs> What else uh, to prepare your studio? Goodness, we talked about deadlines, nutrition. Oh, making sure you stretch, cross train, all of that. It's definitely stretch, but cross training, making sure your students are getting in, whether it's weight training, some biking, some jump roping or calisthenics. Cross training will help you win and keep you safe and prevent injury. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would definitely recommend too, like um, some sort of cardio, because as we all know, it takes a lot to get through that entire routine. So if you're able to like get through some strenuous, like especially upper body, I would do the 
the battle ropes because <laughs> it was a, such an overwhelming upper body workout for me. And I worked myself up to four, four minutes at one point. Don't know if I'll do that again. Um, but it was a really good uh, endurance challenge for me. And I found that I wasn't really tired when I got through my routine, probably because I had worked myself up to it. So yeah, providing the, the coaching and training for strength and flexibility, rest. Uh, um, stretching as rest, taking care of your body. That could be a spa, a sauna, a rock massage, a massage, one of the rollers, the massage rollers, really giving your body the love more love than you normally would. I mean, we should be giving our body love all the time, but definitely when you're training for a competition, give those muscles a little rub down before bed or when you wake up, anything at all. Right, yeah. Sometimes, you know, if you've never worked as hard as you've worked, you know, toward this goal of being in a competition, you will you might notice like your muscles get really tight and, you know, you can't work with tight muscles. They need to be like malleable and squishy. So get those massagers. I have one of those like mechanical ones that you like drape over and you just kind of like chill out. I also have like a foot one. Um, yeah, just be really, really good to your body and always remind yourself rest is practice. You know, don't work out too much. Don't tire yourself out. Um, and don't bully yourself too. If like there's a week where you're like, Oh, I didn't get to practice at all that's fine. <laughs> like sometimes taking a week off is, is really good for your body. Just listen to your body and uh, yeah. And train smart. <laughs> train smart. <laughs> there was something else I was thinking of too. I forget what it is. Oh, having your students practice in their costumes as soon as they get them and remind them to, in their props, and remind them to practice in all of this from the beginning. Like when you're choreographing your routine, like don't just be like, oh, a month before, I'm gonna add like butterfly wings <laughs> and expect your butterfly wings to work. Or don't be like, oh, you know, my my costume has a little skirt, um, but I'll just I'll just wear it the day of and see how it goes. And then you don't realize that the skirt is going to block you from all of your pull sits um, and everything else. So please uh, encourage your students to practice as much as they can in their costumes. I'm ridiculous and I will, yeah. <laughs> Are you making a song? <laughs> oh, you're on mute. I can't really hear. <laughs> I always practice in your costumes. <laughs> So I was going to suggest to you, like, I'm extra ridiculous when I um, practice with my costume. I will have two of the same costume. I will have yes. two of the same shoes because I don't want to bust my shoe like a week before the competition or like outside the competition, which has happened to me before. I busted my foot and my shoe. Um, so you want to be prepared. Um, if you want to be like me, get two of everything <laughs> and world pole training manual they both say have two or three extra outfits so if it's professionally said you know it's true <laughs> yeah yeah there was one time i um i'll bring up the the time when i fell in the hole i had my he heels on it was this old ass theater and i was like rushing to get backstage and i i don't know i should have taken my heels off you guys but i just had to keep them on and I fell in the hole and I um, sprained my foot um, literally an hour before I went on stage and decided at the last minute that I can't wear this sexy outfit. I put on a non-sexy outfit, took the shoes off and did a non-sexy routine <laughs> at the last minute. Um, and luckily I was doing the free dance. <laughs> still falling in the hole with or without heels. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny too, because like I fell in the hole I hobbled backstage and I was like, I'm still going to do this. And then I twisted it again. And I was like, no, <laughs> the universe is telling me to take my shoes off. So I listened, you know. <laughs> but like shit can happen. So, um, you know, bring up those things. They, they likely won't happen, but just bringing them up will have your students be prepared for ridiculous, ridiculousness. Feedback. Yeah, like Read whatever the rules are. I'm telling you, read it. It'll tell you everything you need. 
yeah, yeah. You don't want to do like the wrong trick and like that'll get your points deducted for no reason. Like there's wrong props, wrong music, wrong trick, like just, yeah. Yeah. Are you like, um, a lot of times, like some, in some competitions you can touch the truss and like twirl your stuff around, but some of them you can't touch any of the equipment anywhere, just the poles. And if you accidentally touch it, you might get a deduction. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All the you, little rules, like props sometimes can't fly off the stage for safety of the audience. So make sure you, your props stay on the stage. <laughs> sometimes there are rules that benefit you like um world pole if you add multiple types of dance you'll get extra points um if you do a song they've never heard of or a combination of songs um and a little compilation that they've never heard of you get extra points little things like that so it's very important you read that damn book i know it's long and irritating but it has some good information for you (laughs) right i know for our students i'm like i'm gonna post this rule Thing a million times because you'll need it <laughs> you'll need it i'll need it i refer to it like three times a day yes. um, there's yeah. so much information. like you'll read it and you'll be like yeah i got this but then there's so much you forget one little thing and you're like oh fuck i forgot that yeah it's for- i read this but i just forgot it yeah yeah and look for any like updated rules that may have occurred too because a lot of times You know, you may have thought it was a certain way for many years and then they might have updated it and you had no idea. So make sure you update yourself and your students every single time. Yes. So we have discussed a lot to prepare your studio. um, Check the deadlines and make sure all the students know. Find out students who want to compete. Possibly create workshops and classes that benefit your students. Create a group ch- group chat to motivate them. Get some apparel or some a nice little uh, brunch or potluck to get them together, motivate them. Start practicing before two weeks or I mean two months. Sorry. Two <laughs> weeks. <laughs> practicing with props and your clothes we've discussed quite a bit about preparing your studio yeah yeah <laughs> i think that's i think you, that's it yes if you want more information on training and how to train for a competition you can check out the other episode um we will add that i guess we can add it in the notes why not <laughs> yeah yeah we'll add it in there so if this is a good um if you are like all excited to get your team together and you've never done it before and then you want to help you know your students coaching them individually that would be a good episode to watch because that will really like we talked about a lot (laughs) and get ready for a competition facts we covered so much this episode wasn't supposed to be this long i know it always happens there's a lot like there's just a lot to think about and it's easier when when somebody has you know thought about it before because sometimes if you go in there like like last year I thought we were so so prepared but it was really our first time going as a team and we learned a lot and now I feel like we're more confident this year and every year will be different (laughs) very different competing by yourself and competing on a team for sure (laughs) yeah yeah I really I prefer competing with a team because it was fun when we did it just on our own but I really enjoy the togetherness and the feedback that you get from everyone and learning, um, you know, learning about everyone's different styles and everything is cool too. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else? Oh, so yes. Oh, if you're looking for pole classes or tutorials, check out our new online pole course. Lots of tutorials and conditioning exercises just in time for the pole competition training season. And more will be updated. updated every or added or uploaded sorry more videos will be uploaded every month for more stuff that we create or even learn it has a whole shitload of videos um truly proud of it um you get the first if you sign up you get three days free and then it's five dollars for the first six months and then it goes to ten dollars a month after that but unlimited updates and unlimited videos for you to use at your disposal at any time um, and feel free to always message us if you want to see anything, because we love that, too. <laughs> yes. That's such an amazing price for all that stuff. And you did such yeah. an a- awesome job with it. It looks so cool. <laughs> I mean, 
as always, our goal is to provide affordable poll information, but still try to make a living so we can continue to do this for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that'll be like a, a do your own sort of coaching thing. But if you wanted to work one-on-one with us for whatever reason, for tricks, you know, combos, flow, or if you wanted to train for a competition, Chris and I will be happy to assist you either with online privates, or if you wanted to come to our studio in Springfield, Massachusetts, that would be cool too. And don't forget our virtual showcase coming up. The link to upload videos are is now up if you're ready. Um, doesn't have to be a long video, just a cute little combo, just so you can perform and hopefully other people from around the world will watch and submit videos as well. Um, that will submit that, we'll put that link in the notes below. Um, so yeah, hope to see what y'all have, can't wait. Um, what else do we have? The poll course, the virtual showcase, um, videos for that are due at the end of August. The showcase is in September. Um, feel free to like this podcast episode or the YouTube um, and subscribe and follow. So the platforms will share us to other people who need this information because we're trying to grow, of course, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we, it seems like people are liking the the stories and everything that we're sharing. So. <laughs> yeah. no, so I think it's helpful because, um, you know, we don't want to go off into the the sunset without having shared our, our stories and how awesome the pool community is. And, um, yeah. So and we share, so share. Speaking of stories, um, uh, if you are interested in um, learning more about the founder of PSO, Pool Sport Organization, um, in a few weeks, we'll be, we have the honor of interviewing the amazing Amy Guyon, um, who is the founder of PSO. And we're so excited for that. Um, I believe that episode should be airing September 1st. I think that was the date. Yes. So stay tuned. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Yeah. So and if you have any questions, yeah. <laughs> if you have any questions, burning questions you want to ask Amy Guyon, maybe like um, how she started, anything about um, her business model and anything like that, um, we'd be happy to ask for, for you. Yes. Oh, um, let us know on Instagram or email. Um, which will all be down below in the comments, of course, as always. Anything else? Uh, that new course, um, virtual showcase. If I guess if you want to be interviewed, we are oh, yeah. we are taking interviews. Um, we have quite a few scheduled already that will bring us to the summer. And of course, we'll keep providing you with those pole dancer interviews and pole dance education. But if you want to get interviewed, let us know. We'll send you a link to book an interview. We would love to share your story from wherever you are. Let us know. Yes. Yes. Whether you're a new polar or advanced or wanting to get back into pole, you know, you could be a stripper, like you could be any sort of any sort of involvement in poll, we want to hear your story and and you'll definitely inspire others. Yes. Well, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we should sign out. I know. <laughs> after all that marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There's so much, you guys. Oh, marketing. Wow, are you ready to sign out? Yes, let's do this. <laughs> Well, my name is Mandy Mack. And I am Chris Rivers. <laughs> we are Pole on the Call. Yes, we are. And I have my, we are signing out. What was I doing? <laughs> I know, I was like, let me put these on. <laughs> yes. So cute. Right? My heels match my shirt. They do. <laughs> Love it. <laughs>